Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Dave Caro, and we'll just get started in just one sec. So uh, welcome to this webinar. It's Continuous Delivery in the Wild. I'm kind of excited about having this conversation today because uh, joining me today is, is Pete Hodgson, and he just completed a book by the same title. Let's, uh, Pete, let's jump to the next slide and do a quick intro, and then we'll get jump into this. There we go. All right. Uh, so again, my name is Dave Caro. <laughs> And I'm a continuous delivery evangelist at Split. I'm kind of a lucky guy. My job is basically to learn what people are doing on the kind of leading edge of continuous delivery uh, and, uh, and then get to turn back and share that with others. And uh, that's sort of in, in, in a microcosm is kind of what Pete's done with this book. So go ahead, Pete, you want to, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Pete Hodgson. I'm an independent software delivery consultant. Um, what, I, what I spend most of my time doing these days is, is helping um, engineering organizations kind of level up their software delivery practices. So a lot of that is around kind of things like continuous delivery, agile engineering practices, um, helping teams kind of get better at delivering high quality software at a sustainable pace. Um, and I also operate slides, hopefully. Yeah, hey, and so um, what, I'm, what I'm here to talk about today is this, as, as Dave said, is this book, um, that I, that I, this report that I recently produced uh, with, with support from Split. So thank you, Split, for the support. Um, and the, the motivation for this report was um, I, spend, I spend a lot of my time working in, in the kind of continuous delivery space and read a lot of blog posts and, and kind of watch a lot of conference talks from these kind of bleeding edge practitioners who are doing this kind of amazing stuff in, in the world of continuous delivery. Uh, but what, what I don't think we hear that much about is the kind of the, the real world stories of, of how kind of the average typical companies are succeeding with, with continuous delivery. So, um, you know, I, 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 what I wanted to do is kind of focus on kind of like real talk rather than conference talks, essentially. Um, and so the way I did that is I, I went out and, and talked to a bunch of organizations that are succeeding with continuous delivery. Uh, so here's, here's a kind of a... Um, uh, a slide kind of showing some of the most of the organizations that I was talking to and um, the, the kind of the common theme with all of these organizations is they were all um, deploying software to production on at least a daily basis. So they're all reasonably successful uh, with continuous delivery. Um, but apart from that, they're very, very different. You can see they kind of in a bunch of different industry verticals. Um, some of them were founded in the 50s. Some of them were founded a few years ago. Some of them are like 20 engineers. Some of them are like 800 engineers. Uh, some of them have these big stonking monoliths. Some of them have these super whizzy, fancy pants, uh, microservice architectures. So really, really wide kind of gamut of, um, of organizations, but, but all succeeding with continuous delivery. So I wanted to find out why or what they were doing. Uh, and the way I, way I did that is I interviewed all these companies, the engineers at these companies, and, and asked them about their, um, their path to production. So uh, what is it that takes an idea from kind of an engineer's keyboard through to um, a user's hands. And, um, and what was really interesting to me is despite all of that variance in the types of organizations, the path to production was actually, um, was actually fairly similar. So it, uh, it's kind of interesting that, that despite all these differences, they, they all had some very kind of common themes uh, in the way that they were um, releasing software um, and doing continuous delivery. Um, but also some interesting variances. So that's, that's what I want to talk about today is those similarities and those differences. And, and we're going to do that um, with these kind of four sections. So first of all, I'm going to talk about this kind of commonality uh, that I saw in a lot of these organizations around um, reducing batch size. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the ways that uh, these organizations kind of did it, it kind of express that philosophy in different ways. So we'll talk about how their architecture affected the way they reduced batch size um, how they were doing branch management differently and, and, and how they're doing, um, uh, deli how delivery platforms kind of played into that. Um, and so, so we're going to kind of go through each of these sections and, and after each one, uh, we'll pause and, and, and me and Dave will have a little chit chat about, about some of the, some of the stuff I've talked about. Um, and, and also as we, as we go, if, if you've got questions that are coming up, definitely throw them into, uh, the little Q and A, um, finger me jigsy there. Um, so that we can we can kind of cover them. Uh, hopefully, we'll we'll cover some of them as we go along, and we'll also have some time for some general uh, some general Q and A at the end. So, uh, so with that, I'll get get started. So, um, so as I said, I wanted to to kind of start off by talking about this idea of re reducing batch size. It's a very common theme. So, what do I mean by re reducing batch size? Um, 
Well, there was this metaphor that came up during my research with, uh, with, with one organization, which I really liked. Um, it's this idea of kind of considering like your software delivery process as kind of a conveyor belt, right? So you've got engineers who are kind of like putting stuff onto uh, this conveyor belt. And then um, at some point, some other engineers or testers or other folks are kind of like validating the stuff that, that is on its way to prod. And then eventually it kind of goes into production. And if you think about like a, a more kind of uh, traditional software release process where maybe you're releasing monthly or quarterly or even, you know, every two weeks, um, it can kind of look a little bit like this where you've got these kind of large batches of changes um, that are kind of batching up and then going to production. So through that kind of two week cycle or month cycle, engineers are kind of piling more and more and more stuff in the kind of like ready to go bucket. And then, and then every month it goes, right? Or every two weeks or whatever. Um, but, and those large batch sizes uh, can kind of cause some real issues around uh, kind of like obviously the feedback loop is longer, um, issues around kind of quality and like knowing what's actually changing when you release something. Um, kind of it's hard to correlate what, why something broke. Like you release something and something broke and like what changed? Well, a lot of stuff changed, right? Mm. Um, and then if you contra contrast that with kind of the um, the size of the batches when you're releasing frequently is a big change. If you're releasing changes to production every day, then the amount of stuff you're releasing every time um, is a lot smaller, right? Just kind of like there's less stuff because the engineers have had less time to put stuff on the conveyor belt because you, the last time you released was only a day ago. Um, and what, what was interesting to me, really interesting to me is how many of the companies I talked to mentioned batch size and reducing batch size as like a big driver for them. Uh, some of the like really high performing folks I spoke to essentially said they didn't think their processes, their delivery processes would work at all if, um, if the batch sizes got too big, like they, they just, it wouldn't work. Like the way they were doing things was, was kind of um, required kind of small batch sizes. Um, so, so yeah, there was this really interesting focus on that. Um, but as I said, there was, a, it, it was also interesting how um, different companies kind of, achieved that kind of goal of small batch sizes in different ways, depending on their context. And that's, that's something we'll, we'll, we'll kind of cover and talk more about as we, as we go through the webinar today. Um, so this focus on reducing batch size uh, isn't, isn't kind of that surprising. Uh, there's, there's kind of science behind it. So, so there's this great book called Accelerate by uh, Dr. Nicole Falsgreen, Jess Humble, Jean Kim, um, and uh, what they did in this book is they, is they took a bunch of data from um, this survey that they've been doing every year. This, I think it's the state of DevOps. Um, they survey a bunch of organizations and then they kind of apply science. They use statistics um, and analyze that data. And one of the things they did is they built this construct called um, software delivery performance. And so they basically said that these four things put, put together kind of define your software delivery performance. So lead time, deployment frequency, mean time to change, change fairly percentage. And if you think about um, reducing batch size, that's kind of the inverse of deployment frequency. The more frequently you deploy, the smaller your batch size is, or the smaller your batch size is kind of Im implies that you're, you're deploying more frequently. And so, um, so there's this kind of relationship there between small batch sizes and their definition of kind of software delivery performance. Now where it gets really interesting is they, demonstrated again kind of statistically um, that software delivery performance an organizational an, an organization's software delivery performance drives organizational performance and when we talk about organizational performance they're talking about like money they're talking about like how the how the company is doing in the stock market uh, how profitable it is that kind of stuff um, or the kind of the equivalent measures for for like a nonprofit. Um, so so what they kind of showed is the practices like reducing batch size actually drive kind of like more money in the bank, uh, bigger bonuses for people. So um, it's, not, it's not really that surprising um, in that context. It's not that surprising that a lot of the organizations I spoke to were really focused on, on reducing batch size. I think they perhaps had kind of discovered for themselves that there was this relationship between, uh, by doing that, they were able to kind of perform better uh, as a company. So, um, Makes sense that there was a focus there, but again, what I found interesting was how these different companies were applying that in different ways. And, um, and that, that's, what we'll, that's what we'll talk about um, is, is kind of how they achieved that principle in different ways uh, during this webinar. But I'll, I'll kind of pause it there and, um, 
Dave, what's your what's your take on all of this? This so science. Whenever I yeah, whenever I hear about reducing batch size, I always remember the kind of big aha I had when I was reading DevOps Handbook. Um, and this is actually a photo of my dog-eared copy because I don't have the book mm. with me today. But but uh, in there is a section on flow, on how to achieve flow, and the example they give um, is very ordinary world, which is if you had. Um, it actually is based on a blog post by uh, Stefan, I believe it's Luton, uh, from 2014. And it was, he's, hmm. he's going to stuff some envelopes. So imagine you're going to send 10 brochures to customers and you're going to sort of fold the brochures, put them in envelopes, seal the envelopes and stamp the envelopes. And, and if you work in large batch sizes, you'd make all the brochures and then you'd fold all the brochures and then you'd insert them all and then you'd seal them all and then you'd stamp them, right? Right. And some interesting things happen, which is one, no letter goes out until you've done all four of those very large tasks. Two, if you figure out that the envelopes are the wrong size, you've actually folded all the brochures <laughs> before you ever figure that out, right? So you've yeah. literally created this giant inventory yeah. before you realize that it's broken. And it's waste. Um, so you've got to throw all of those away, right? Or redo them all or something. Yeah, so, so the cool thing about smaller batch sizes is, is a couple things. One, faster time to value. So you get something out to, the, to production, to the users, yep. much faster. And you're less likely to spend six months creating, um, I'll just say a dead end. I was going to refer to a cluster-based technology. But uh, um, uh, that you, know, you spend six months going nowhere. It, you won't, that won't happen to you if you're working in small batch size because if you're actually turning right. the crank often. Yeah, um, you know, it's funny because small reducing batch size is really pretty, pretty heavily synonymous with high cadence, like you were saying. You, yeah, you, right. Yeah, so yeah. Kind of that, the having you know, having that in their back pocket, that envelope stuffing example. Um, uh, you know, the, if you if you want to find that blog post, it's you know why uh, mass production isn't the most efficient way to build stuff uh, or doing stuff, um, and it's also in in the flow part of the DevOps handbook. Yeah, and I think like like the, this is the like the kind of stuff that the the folks in in lean manufacturing have have been uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, shouting about since like the '80s, right? Like, which is wow, forty years, yeah. Like Toyota kicking the American car industry's butt because um, they focused on um, lean, right? Like reducing reducing inventory, reducing work in progress, reducing batches. Um, I think it's it's kind of that's one of the reasons I really love that, that book, the Accelerate book, is I think people have been kind of like yelling about this in the context of uh, other industries and kind of saying like, hey, you know, this also applies, these ideas also apply in software. And I think there was, to some extent, some healthy skepticism around like, yeah, but like building a car is very different from building, building software. software. So like that doesn't, doesn't really apply to us. Um, and I, but I think this book kind of actually kind of like uses science to... Um, to show that, that at least for this, at least this aspect of um, of lean uh, does translate uh, very quickly from software. And I think I think you're totally right. Like this is that those two things of like reducing time to value or uh, yeah, reducing time to value, like getting value into the users' hands faster, even if it's a smaller amount of value, um, and and reducing waste is um, is really interesting. This is another one too, where sort of the paradox paradox, what I call kind of the paradox of DevOps, which is sometimes people hear about working in two week sprints or daily deployments or whatever. And then they go, Oh my God, that sounds so stressful. That, right. You know, that, right. It's oh, that, right. I, it's like running on a hamster wheel. Um, and, and the irony is it's the reverse, which is that if you're, if you go back to your slide that has the very small boxes coming across the conveyor belt, a few at a yeah. time, right. Um, it's way easier to inspect those little boxes yeah. and go to lunch then say, oh my God, I'm going to be here all night because the complexity of this big pile of stuff we're going to try to release tonight is crazy, you know, right? So people will, and I, I will probably preach into the choir that people are on the call today, um, but moving to a faster cadence isn't less humane, it's more humane. It, yeah. It's actually more, it simplifies, it doesn't make life crazier. I mean, yes, some things have to be worked out. You have to automate some things. But you have to change the way you're working. You have to change the way you're working in a very big way to make it happen. But but once you do, or if you can, then um, I, I totally agree. I think it's a much more it's a much more humane way of working and it lets you be involved in the whole in the whole process of, of delivering software. Like I think it one of the things that I um, 
was talking to charity majors who's like uh, the one of the one of the people behind uh, honeycomb she's like big in the observability space and one of the things that um she was kind of like making me realize is a lot of this kind of devops stuff is about kind of or at least a big benefit of it is, is actually kind of connecting you to um to your end users like if you're the person that's not just like typing it on the keyboard and then throwing it over the wall to to other folks who then throw it over the wall and eventually throw it to the users. If you're the person that's like almost literally kind of carrying it to uh, carrying right. your, your changes to, to your user and then seeing how they're using it and getting that feedback, then um, I think that's a, like for a lot of people, that's a much more rewarding experience as well. Yeah. Again, more humanizing, right? Like yeah. it's, it's, you know, the first time I met a person who worked in biotech or they explained that they might work on a project for six years and then move on to a new project before that project ever becomes a medicine. Like I was like, yeah, oh my God, I, I am, I am not wired for that. I could not do. Yeah. I like to check boxes and see smiling faces Yep. Uh, or, you know, a frowny face is fine if they can explain. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing that, that feedback, that thing you were saying around kind of like reducing the time to feedback of like, oops, I stuffed my envelopes wrong. Funny thing is I actually did this job. Uh, I remember as a teenager, like my dad paid me, um, probably an illegally low wage to, um, to stuff envelopes for his, for his company. And intuitively, uh, we did the batch size thing because intuitively it feels more efficient to do big batches. And it uh, turns out that like, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not right. a good idea. Right. Um, oh yeah, so, so and, and the, where I was going with that was, so there's this idea of um, like, oops, the, the envelope is totally the wrong size. Like I have to throw all this stuff away. But there's also a smaller version of that where it's like, oops, like, I could have done this slightly better. Right. So yeah. like, like closing that feedback loop of your users means that you can kind of like make all these little course corrections, um, driving in the right way rather than having to, um, kind of like make these big, big drastic changes because you're only getting feedback every, um, you know, every month or every two weeks or something like that. So right. I think there's a lot of, a lot of different types of feedback that you benefit. Cool. From. Let's jump, let's jump to the next, uh, next section. Yeah. Um, See if I can operate my slides. I and I mean, it goes, go, hopefully goes without saying, I, we're, we're basing this conversation on the book. The book is readily available. If you want a copy of the book, um, um, uh, I assume most of you have probably already seen uh, the, the book. Uh, and I've got a couple of Q and A's here. I'll, I'll address those in just a sec. Um, someone did ask, by the way, whether, whether recording is, we'll share if we definitely are. Um, so uh, if you haven't already got a copy of the book, we'll definitely take care of that. Uh, uh, before the end of the webinar, and then um, uh, at the very end of the webinar, we're gonna we're gonna give away a care package to somebody uh, 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 with some goodies from uh, Edible in the Wild. Anyway, let's jump to the next one. Okay. Um, so um, architecture and and release management. So so this is the first example of where we're we're gonna kind of talk about how um, different how how kind of the different context of organizations kind of changed how they achieved these, these values. So uh, I want to talk about um, kind of SOA versus monolith. So um, the organizations I spoke to, you could kind of broadly categorize the architectures they had into these two categories. So uh, on the left, we've got kind of a service oriented architecture, or if you're feeling trendy microservices um, and, um, and on the right, we've got like large monolithic systems. And um, if we think about it in terms of release management and deployment, um, I think the, the biggest difference, the, the, this, this kind of actually really big difference um, between these two architectures is around kind of ownership of deployable artifacts. So with a, a microservice architecture, a team um, owns one or more services, but generally a service is only owned by like a single team and that service is kind of like an independently deployable unit. So it's an independently deployable artifact, so almost by definition, if we're talking about microservices here. Um, and so for any given kind of deployable unit, um, you, there's, there's one team that's like making changes and it's only one team. If you contrast that with a monolith, I, I kind of like my working definition of a monolith at the moment is a piece of software that's big enough that multiple teams are working a regular, on a regular basis on a single kind of deployable thing. So it's this large thing that's deployed monolithically and, um, and there's more than one team making changes to that at the same time. And it, you know, interestingly, that doesn't mean the monolith has to be one process, right? You can get like a distributed monolith where you've got 17 different 
microservices, but if they all have to be deployed together, then um, you don't really, you haven't really got microservices there. You've got um, a big kind of like distributed ball of mud rather than a, a kind of single ball of mud. So, um, so what that means in terms of uh, release management is really interesting because if you've got a single team owning a deployable artifact, they're able to make um, the, the, they're able to, to really, really reduce the batch sizes for, for each of those deployable artifacts because they know what's happening. So if you think about like, a, I'm, I'm, I'm Jane working on, a, working on my microservice and I've made a, a five line change and I've committed it to master or mainline for that microservice. And I'm thinking like, oh, I want to deploy that change to prod. Um, if, if it's a service where like I own it or just like my team owns it, I can very easily find out like what other stuff has changed since we last deployed. And I can kind of understand that set of changes and I'm confident in pushing that through all the way through to production. In contrast, if I'm Jane making a five line chain to change to a monolithic application, hmm. it's actually really hard to understand like what other changes have happened since we last deployed. Um, and, and, and if you asked, if you asked someone who's working on a monolith, are you confident that these, that the current set of changes can be deployed? It's a much harder question to answer and that they're much less likely to be confident than if you said, uh, you know, are you confident in the small set of changes in, in this monolithic system? So what that means is the practices, the release engineering practices are really different. So for, uh, if you're working with microservices, very often, most of the organizations I spoke to, Jane, the engineer, would make the change, and then Jane would literally walk that change all the way through to production. So she would uh, say, like, this change is ready to go into staging, or maybe it would already be in staging. She'd check the change in staging and then press a button or whatever, and that change goes out to production. And so you can get really low batch sizes that way. Um, in contrast, with monoliths, it just doesn't, that's just not a sustainable way of doing things. As much as you would like it to be a sustainable way of doing things, it's just not. And so um, while I, when a lot of the organizations I spoke to, they, they dealt with that by um, using kind of practices like, um, like the release bus. So this is this idea of uh, rather than saying like every change gets walked out to prod because that's too scary and Jane's not, not, gonna, not gonna do it, frankly. Like what happens is engineers just end up just not doing it because they're not sure what else is gonna go out. So they just don't deploy it and they wait for someone else to do that, right? Um, so, so with a release bus, what you do is you say, every day we're deploying whatever has changed that day to production or every hour or every two days or, or whatever. Um, and so, so on that schedule, let's say every day, um, we look at what changes have happened since the last deploy. We find out what engineers were involved and we kind of say to all the engineers, hey, your changes are on their way out to production. Are you ready to go? And the engineers kind of say, yep, ready to, ready to kind of shepherd my changes. And those changes kind of flow to a staging environment, the engineers involved or whoever uh, test those changes. And then, and then uh, those changes flow out to prod. And if there's any issues, we know which engineers to kind of ping in, in Slack or IRC or whatever. Um, and if something goes sideways, we just give up on that whole deployment. And we say, oh, well, everyone get back, bus goes back to the depot, everyone get back off the bus, we'll, we'll get on the bus tomorrow and try again. Um, so you're not getting the same uh, batch size reduction that you do with, this, with, with microservices. You're not able to deploy like a single lines within, you know, you're not able to within an hour kind of take a, a code change and, and roll it out to production. But you are still able to get like, a daily release frequency if, if you've chosen daily to be your frequency. Um, so you're, you're still able to like actually really reduce the batch sizes compared to like a two week sprint. Um, you're just not able to do it in, in the exact same way um, as, you, as you could with, uh, with microservices. So I think this is a really good example of why context matters. Um, uh, Facebook, for example, are operating with a really big monolith and their release practices reflect that. If you're working with a different architecture like microservices, then kind of just cargo culting or parroting what Facebook does because Facebook is succeeding with it, that doesn't necessarily make sense, right? And, and vice versa, if you're talking to some company who's got 800 microservices, but you're working with a monolith, um, just because they're succeeding with their practices doesn't mean that, that you wanna apply them 
wrote without kind of considering your context. So I think it's interesting to see how different organizations were, were winning in different ways and kind of that battle to reduce batch sizes depending, depending on their architecture. So what's your take on that, Dave? Well, so when you were um, when you were going over the sort of left side and the right side and some of the differences in culture and how you it, it, it reminds me of the term that Gene Kim uses in his latest book, the uh, Unicorn Project, which is locality. So yeah, right. So when when everything that matters is kind of very contained, things are simpler, and yeah. you can more confidently say, "Hey, I." I can move this, but yeah. when you have 15 hands in the pie, uh, odds are good that somebody's not going to know something they should know and something's going to go wrong. Um, and so having that, you know, I often, it's funny when I travel, I'll explain two pizza team to people, the, the notion that, you know, a small team is say 10 to 12 people or whatever people you could feed with two pizzas. Um, mm -hmm. and, Again, some of the things are super intuitive once you think about it. If you're in a small group that's either co-located or extremely chatty with, you know, Slack and Zoom or whatever, um, you all know what you're doing this week and you all know why you're doing it and you all know what's supposed to happen when it works. Yeah. And you can all watch it when it rolls out and any of you can probably figure out whether it's behaving as, as desired. Yeah. When you have a, a giant silo, we have all these huge silos of different people, you have the sort of you know, remember the old days, we have specifications and release and acceptance processes and all this stuff. And it, it never really worked that well. Um, I mean, depending on your mileage, but like, so I think that, um, but I think what's awesome, as you pointed out, that you could be doing a monolith and still have fast cadence and small back sizes. Yeah, right? you're not going to get as fast as, I mean, you're unlikely to get all of other things being equal. You're not going to get as fast as if you had an SOA, but you also get a lot of the benefits of a monolith. It's actually really easy to operate a monolith. It's actually really easy to run a monolith on your laptop. <laughs> it's not easy to stand up 800 services on your laptop, turns out. So uh, it's not like a, a cut or dry thing. It's a bunch of trade-offs. And uh, if you're working with a monolith, um, either through choice or through legacy or whatever, you still got to figure out ways to be successful with it, right? Yeah. And, and P, we had a question, which was, you know, do you have any guidelines on right sizing? Speaking of that, right? On right sizing services, monolith tends to be the wrong on one end of the spectrum in their mind, but services can be too small, leading yeah. to the services to manage. So yeah. any thoughts on how people balance that? Yeah. I mean, I think like the guidance I always give to, to my clients when they're asking about this is focus on, um, focus first on the business boundaries. So uh, kind of organize your boundaries around, organize your services, try and shape your services to reflect your business. Your business is, is fairly stable. Um, it tends to map to organizational structures, which is useful because you kind of want your architecture to, to map to organizational structures. So if you can focus on, the first step is, is finding those seams around your business, you know, so like inventory management and customer service and I don't know, like, um, the way that business people talk about your business is, is, is where those boundaries should be. So domain driven design is, is, is the word that you should Google. Um, and then I advise companies that are getting started with this to start big, bigger, like a bigger service. If you're not sure, make the service bigger than you think than like err on the side of too big and put in some internal boundaries between uh, different areas of that service that you think might end up being smaller. Um, so don't start off with smaller services, um, start off with bigger kind of, uh, a client of mine was calling them macro services. I've heard the word modular monolith, um, start, start bigger is my advice and, but leave yourself some seams where you can slice once you know, um, once you know, once you're more confident that you've got those kind of boundaries in the, in the right place. That's, that's my, my kind of general guidance. I mean, that's like an entire Yep. Like hour of conversation just in and of itself to be right, honest. Right. There's another sort of related question, which is, does team size also play a role in determining if you should do microservice or monolith, for example, if there's only one developer in the team? I mean, I guess it does. I think that there's, so I think that the rule that you should follow is only one team should be working with a given, like only one team should be regularly making changes to a given microservice, but that doesn't mean they can't, that can't, that team can't own more than one. Um, that's generally the guidance, but yeah, I think it definitely plays, plays a size because, you know, um, Conway's law tells us that, um, architecture reflects your teams. And if you try and like make your architecture, not reflect your teams, 
uh, you're going to lose. It's like trying to fight gravity just because you, you know, you can try it doesn't mean you're going to win. Um, so you've got to kind of embrace that. Um, I like to talk about wielding Conway's law rather than yielding to Conway's law. Um, mm. So yeah, you've got to factor team well, size and, so, and team shape. So into that let's sure. go back to the question though, because the question was really, let's say you only had one developer, like, mm -hmm. right? So if it's truly just one developer, maybe it sort of doesn't matter. But uh, back when you and I were talking to Gene Kim, he was talking about a lot of these practices even makes sense for one person that's context shifting from one thing to the next a lot. Uh, um, if you have a very big complex thing and you're kind of jumping around, it's a little trickier to keep track of where, what your state is. Even like you were saying, if you're working on monolith, you don't know who, who else has made changes. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, you know, if you're working on, if you, if you've broken your work, your system up into five services, then you can deploy those independently. Then each deployment you kind of, you've got like essentially like a, the blast radius is reduced. Like you, it's less likely that deploying an update to like the catalog system is going to break login. Right. Um, I mean, it's not, not, not as likely that, that would happen in a monolith, but um, right. yeah, I, I mean, there's other, other advantages to it, but um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, I think as you said that this, there may be sort of a whole follow up on like if people are, I mean, everybody's in a different place in their transition from one kind of way of doing software to yeah. another. But, um, um, yeah. So we'll hopefully maybe we'll come back in the general Q and A. And 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 Chris asked a question a while back on batch sizes, which we'll get to in the main Q and A. So let's let's go ahead and jump on to the next section. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So uh, next up, let's talk about um, branch management. So when I was talking to to these organizations, there was two uh, two distinct kind of branch, branching strategies that that these organizations described to me. Uh, so most teams were were kind of practicing some variant of GitHub flow, um, and this is this is kind of like very very common these days in in industry. So you've got like this kind of mainline, so master or trunk or developer or whatever you want to call it, this kind of shared integration branch that the team integrate their work with, um, but development happens on feature branches. So Jane, the developer, has a feature that she wants to build. She branches off of master or trunk or mainline, whatever you want to call it, um, makes her changes as a series of commits. And then once she's ready to go, uh, she submits a, a pull request or a merge request, gets a code review, the review passes, stuff gets merged. And at the same time, other people are doing the same thing. So um, this was a very, very common, pretty typical way, way of working. Um, in a lot of teams, uh, but but some teams were were taking kind of a different approach. This kind of trunk-based development idea, uh, where essentially your developers are working directly on that mainline branch or that master branch, so they're not branching, making a feature branch and then merging it in. Literally, they're just committing directly to uh, to master. Um, and what that means, is, and uh, whenever I describe this to people, there's a certain number of people that just freak out. Yeah. the idea of this is crazy like no they don't really do that that's not true uh, it definitely is true um I've, I've, I've worked on teams that did this it was actually pretty awesome um and what that means is uh you've got kind of like lots of small commits kind of constantly landing um landing on that on that master branch um as as people are kind of like part way through the feature part way through the features and it also means kind of you know partial features half finished features uh, landing on master and if you're doing continuous delivery um, those half finished features are potentially going out to production crazy can't do it not possible uh, and we can talk yeah, about we can talk that about behind something again so so yeah so these two kind of different branching styles when i was talking to to these organizations it was interesting to me that these kind of different ways of kind of doing branch management turned into or kind of um, led to or drove kind of two different modes of continuous delivery. Um, and I, I kind of like refer to them as branch based CD versus trunk based CD. Um, and if you're doing kind of trunk based development, um, you can do kind of this trunk based delivery, um, trunk based CD, which means you can get to like really, really small batch sizes, like individual, like single piece flow where Jane, the developer, commits a one line change um, that goes to master. She then says, I want that change to go to prod and she walks it out to prod in, you know, let's say half an hour's time or an hour's time. So really, 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 really tight feedback loop, really small batch sizes, like single bytes kind of batch sizes if you, if you wanted it to be. 
Um, but in order to achieve that, you do need some um, more advanced kind of technical practices. So there's a really good website called trunkbaseddevelopment.com, um, which talks about like some of those practices, but um, we're talking about things like branch by abstraction, uh, feature flagging uh, is a big one. And, you know, the, the, ma mainly like these practices are around how do we, um, there's two things, I guess. There's like, how can we be confident? How can we land stuff on master and get really good feedback quickly? Um, that it's, that, um, that stuff's not broken. Um, how do we get kind of confidence in each change? And also how do we work with half finished stuff potentially going to production and, you know, feature flags is, is a, is the, the kind of standard kind of like the only way really to, to pull that off where you're able to say, you know, I'm halfway through this feature. It's, it's in production. It's, it's on master. It's getting like my, my changes are getting deployed to production, but the feature is hidden from my users. Um, so I, I can be kind of confident in doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, the other, the other thing that, that happens there is around kind of code review, code review practices are very different. You're either, um, doing kind of, uh, continuous code review, also known as pair programming, right? Like, so if you're doing pair programming where two of you are working on the code at the same time, you're essentially kind of continuously code reviewing, uh, or code review is done post factum. So after the merge, a post merge review is happening. Um, but there's a potential there that, um, uh, that Jane land something on master, it goes to prod, and then it's only reviewed after it's in production. So there's a lot of kind of, basically this works if you've got really high trust uh, processes that establish high trust in the, in the team. Um, and the way that, uh, when I was talking to teams about this, there was this kind of general agreement that, um, that they're kind of like, if, even the teams that were doing Git, GitHub flow, there was a very strong kind of agreement that long live feature branches were bad. So, you know, the general consensus is like longer than a day is not good. Longer than a day and you're not technically, you're not doing CI, at least the people who coined the term continuous integration would tell you that it has to be, into, continuous integration means at least once a day. And if you've got a feature branch that's longer than a day, then you're not doing CI. Um, so, and most of the organizations I spoke with kind of agreed with that in principle, shorter feature branches was, was important. Again, reducing batch size. If you've got four days worth of changes, you've got four days, you're, that's a batch size, right? Like you, you've, you're kind of, your batch size is increasing because when that lands, it's a big chunk of changes all landing in one batch. So, um, so most of the teams I, I spoke with that were doing uh, GitHub flow were focused on kind of keeping that, keeping those feature branches short, even if they weren't going all the way to kind of like full on, full on trunk based development. But a lot of the teams that I spoke with were doing uh, GitHub flow, but they were still able to kind of succeed with continuous delivery, release into production on a very regular basis, even if they were using short lived uh, feature branches to do it. Yeah. And this is, this is, uh, we've already got a couple of questions, but I, I, uh, um, and I think you touched on this, you know, is trunk based development heavily correlated with pair programming? Yeah. Uh, that would compensate for a lot of the lack of formal yeah. reviews. Yeah. And that's what I, that's what I found. Um, and I was very interested to ask that question. It's actually one of the big questions I wanted to find out when, when I started this research. So mm -hmm. the answer, the answer, at least from the people I spoke with is yes, there's a very heavy correlation there, but not a hundred percent. So, um, there were teams that were doing trunk based development with post merge reviews. Um, they weren't always, um, they were, they were, they were sometimes doing some, they were doing some amount of pair programming, but not hundred percent. And, uh, they just had a very high trust environment and they had a really good kind of process for, um, for kind of pulling out changes that were bad, uh, re respond like a reducing mean time to recovery so they could respond to things breaking. So they were essentially just comfortable with a much more kind of fluid, uh, environment, I would say. Yeah, that gets back to sort of the idea behind continuous delivery. Um, you you want to reduce the cost of change so that you can turn the crank more often with less yeah. fear and less human, you know, yeah. less shouldn't cost you time and money and people to iterate. And if you can iterate quickly, then risk is reduced because you can fix things quickly. Yeah. Uh, provided you can figure out what's broken. Yeah. It's, it's a really interesting divide to me when I've spoken to, to people who have 
done trunk based development for a serious period of time have kind of really gotten the bug and they just don't the idea of kind of having gating a change on a code review like not letting someone land a change until it's got code review just sounds crazy to me they're like god like don't you trust the people you work with but then when you talk to people who have only ever done kind of uh, something like github flow or something where there's always a code review they have the kind of opposite thing of like oh my god like what happens if someone checks in a bug um you know and the answer is well a um that happens all the time. That happens anyway. <laughs> code review actually your, your doesn't is not invincible. Yeah. So it's kind of more about like, well, how about we set up yeah. processes so that we can respond to those changes rather than trying to like stop the stop right. the, the breaking changes because you can't do that anyway. Code review doesn't work. And the bigger the change, the crappier the code review is in terms of catching those changes. Like I've never seen like a 10 file code review where someone is actually really fought. Well, it's, it's rare that someone is actually thoughtfully catching all of the bugs when it's this big batch. If it's a small batch, like you're watching someone typing or you're reviewing these commits as they kind of come in, you're actually, I think, in my opinion, more likely to catch the issues than by batching them up into these feature branches. But that's my, that's my opinion. Yeah. And actually that, that kind of, it's weird because at some point it starts to approach the, what is now kind of, well, your miles may vary, but a lot of people are understanding and the, and the, the statistics are proving that a change, a change review board or a change control board yeah. is actually an anti-pattern. Like yeah, if you work. have to go to some stranger and explain why what you're about to do is safe and have them give it a blessing before you can push it to prod, um, the odds of them actually understanding what you're changing is super low. Uh, and it becomes sort of more of a political thing and just bureaucracy yeah. and slowing things down. And the people who use that structure have less stable systems than people who do pair programming. Yeah, and again, I think I think there you're referring to research from the folk, the Accelerate folks. Uh, they they you know they use science to show that change review boards actually don't work, <laughs> or architecture review boards or whatever you want to call them. Right, and it gets back to locality and small units of work. It gets back to the intuitive stuff, which is if there's not very much to look over, it's easier to look over it. Yep. And if people are already in the context, the domain of what you're working on, they're more likely to understand what you're doing than if there's some buddy over in the other side of a wall you've thrown something to. Yep. Right? Yeah. So we should probably move on to the next one. I want to make sure we have enough time for the Q&A at the yep. end. We kind of yep. cover everything. So let's okay. go ahead and jump on to the next. Yeah, let's talk about the last, last section here is around kind of custom delivery platforms. And so this isn't, um, this isn't necessarily an example of kind of like different ways of working, but it's an example, it's a really interesting example of how all of these organizations were kind of adapting were doing stuff based on their context. So they weren't kind of just taking stuff and applying it rote. They were customizing things for their, for their uh, context. So, um, so when you think about um, reducing batch size, as we've talked about, it means like really frequent deployments, right? Like kind of like there's this kind of inverse relationship there. And if you want to scale that kind of really high frequency deployments, you can't, do it through some centralized like release engineering function like it, at some point if you've got like 20 teams and they're all releasing once a day it's just overwhelming to kind of it's overwhelming to to try and force that through a single like release engineering kind of process um and it's and it just becomes this huge bottleneck right um and so what all these organizations have kind of figured out is um is that the way you do this is by you you kind of push um, that release engineering work down to those individual teams. So um, it's kind of like a devops -y kind of thing, right? Where the teams are owning their deployment process. And the way that you do that is by building good self-service tooling for release management for kind of, so what I kind of refer to as these custom delivery platforms. So that rather than a expert release engineer kind of doing the things, migrating the databases and, um, doing the like typing the, the cube cube cuddle commands to like up roll out a canary release or whatever you give like nicer more user friendly tooling to product engineers who aren't experts in that and let them um, do the work so uh, you know when I was talking to all these organizations they that, that had these kind of custom delivery platforms this is kind of gives you some sense of um, the kind of stuff that they were doing with these with these platforms or the kind of capabilities these platforms had I'm not going to go through all of this in detail but um you know they were able to kind of these allowed pro all of this stuff was stuff that product engineers could do not like some centralized release engineering function so jane the engineer would would be able to kind of like roll out a new version into an environment 
um, say that a version was good to go to prod, say, oh, I think I might have broken something, don't put anything in prod right now, um, look at what had been in prod, um, look at what versions of environments were, uh, sorry, what versions of a service were in which environments, um, that kind of stuff, like do database management or data management tasks, like migrating databases, pulling in kind of production data that was scrubbed, um, and kind of just monitoring the kind of like the overall health of the system. So essentially to get feedback, right? So if Jane has just pushed a, her one line change to prod, uh, she wants somewhere to go and look and see like, is anything going sideways? Um, and so it was interesting to me, this all made sense. And what was interesting to me is that there wasn't anyone using off the shelf tooling to do this. So it doesn't seem um, from the companies I was talking to that there's stuff that, that supports all of this out of the box. Um, and it seems like it's one of these kind of things that needs to be customized. It, 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 the needs of each organization and the tools that they're using and the processes that they're using are different enough that organizations often, uh, seems like almost always find they need to build their own tooling on top of a base, right? So all of these companies were using like a base kind of CI CD system. So, you know, a Jenkins or a circle CI or something like that um, to do kind of like the first part of CI CD. So they were using it to do like the build test, maybe put a, a deployable artifact into, into an artifact repository or something like that. But then they had a lot of custom tooling on top of that, which was um, kind of pushing versions to different environments, keeping track of what was where, kind of doing some kind of like approval, um, thumbs up, thumbs down process, all of that kind of stuff was built on top of these kind of um, these tooling. Um, and a lot of times this started off as uh, kind of like some CLI scripts and like little little command line scripts that the that, that engineers could run and had kind of evolved into like, in some cases, like full on web products. Like there was essentially like a product team that was running this internal product inside of the company and they were um, treating it like a product, which is the, the right thing to do. Um, so this, was a, this was actually, this was clearly significant investment was being done by these organizations in, in these systems, um, which implies, at least to me, that that, that investment was worth it. Because I saw it in, in almost everywhere I went, um, they were building these kind of systems. So it's an expensive proposition to do it, but it's worth it because it allows you again to kind of scale out your your release processes by kind of pushing them down into into your organizations and into your product delivery org, um, your, and your product engineers can kind of own that stuff and and do the do the DevOpsy thing basically. So it was really really interesting to me to see how uh, how many of the organizations were, were doing this in order to again in order to achieve that um that small batch size yeah the uh, i'm reminded you know uh, sometimes people use the term democratize and, and people don't necessarily understand the, the the bottom line is we want to go from people opening tickets to people being able to do stuff you mentioned self-service like mm -hmm. you shouldn't have to slack somebody to do something you shouldn't have to open a ticket to do something you shouldn't put something in a queue to do right. something you actually want to be able to do the thing right and so um, that has rather profound impacts on, on um, velocity, on how fast you can get things done, right? Because if every yeah. handoff, every request yeah. has some kind of a queuing time, you yeah. know it's gonna take longer, right? Um, yeah, and I've, and I've been to organizations that, that are get, just getting started on their CD journey that are definitely feeling the pain of that. They've had a centralized kind of operations group that does release management and they're the CTO um, has said, we're going to start releasing once a week, suck it up <laughs> essentially. Uh, and, uh, and they've just really, really been struggling because they're like, we can't like, there's just too much stuff and everyone's yelling at us. And it's like, uh, it's, and it's tough to, you got to shift your mindset to say like the way that you've solved this is you get out the way you give people tools to do it themselves. Right. right. Committing to a 30 minute turn time. Think about the difference between 30 minutes and 30 seconds. Right. Organizationally. So I think the other thing I think I've heard, um, pretty sure it was Microsoft and a couple others that, that, that made it known that if there was a, a debate between building a feature or, or creating developer productivity, that it was completely a no brainer to start with the developer productivity because they're the ones that are going to be creating the features. So yes, yeah. yeah, leverage. It's the whole constraints thing, right? Start with the biggest constraint, the thing that's causing you the most grief, fix that. Then as you move forward, you'll have less grief on a day-to-day -day basis and address the next thing until you, right, until it's, until it's uh, much, much 
much happier scene. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. What else did I have thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think that the 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 key is is don't have. Uh, so if I, I'm always going back to the books, like in Phoenix Project, there's Brent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, and Brent was like a bottleneck because he was this guru that could fix or figure out anything. And and yeah, you're always going to people have been around longer or whatever. But you you really want to design as many of your processes as possible to be straightforward and doable by anyone. Yep. Uh, my, right. um, my, my former coworker of mine, the, the wonderful Johnny Leroy uh, coined this great phrase, heroes don't scale, which right. is, ca captures that really well. I think like Brent doesn't scale. There's only one of him. And uh, how many times have you been in a meeting where people are like, Oh, if only we had a cloning machine. Cause you know, it'd be great if we had more of your time, Brent. Like that's, that's a sad, that's a sad thing to hear. Cause it's like, wow. Uh, the lottery factor on Brent is uh, is pretty serious. If Brent wins the lottery, we are going to have a tough time. You know, right? Well, it's also it's also it, it not it's not scalable. It's not sustainable. So, yeah. you sh doing a release shouldn't require heroics. It's like yeah. when uh, Jez was talking about why um, why write the book continuous delivery. Well, I love the quotes they have. Like you know, we're tired of we were telling people to release more often, but releases were only being done like at night. And, and we we're missing dinner and weekends and like, we didn't want to miss our family in order to try to adopt this new way of doing things, right? How yeah. do we, how do we make it, um, how do we make it for, how do we kill the release night? How do we do daytime yeah. release? How, how do we, we make do it more humane? Yeah, right. Um, yeah. You get more work done, not because you're doing heroics and you're burning yourself out, but because you've right. built a better machine for building software. Yep. yep. Right. Cool. Let's. Yeah, it's, uh, a tough, it's a tough organizational thing because some organizations, uh, you know, the arsonist firefighter is is held up as an example, and you have to make those kind of cultural changes to reward quietly getting stuff done and going home at five p.m. on a Friday, rather than well, um, you know standing there with the fire hose at ten a.m. on. Yeah, on you have to Sunday reward the simplifiers. You have to reward the people who built a system which lets you do things more easily, faster, less. Yep. Problem, right. Yep. Um, so that whole tooling thing. So I think that's that's our fourth section, right? Correct. Right, yep. Into the full-on Q and A now. Yep. Um, so I'm gonna just quickly look back at the ones we haven't answered yet. Um, and way back at the beginning, Chris asked, you know, can you give more detail on how organizations break up user stories and tasks into smaller batch sizes? Yeah. And I think this, this is one of those things that's like just to do CI. Like, let's not talk about CD. Just to yeah. do CI, you had to have a different way of breaking your problems down yeah. and being able to commit smaller bits of work. Yeah. So what, what do you think here? Yeah, and this is definitely a skill that you learn. Um, and after you've done it for a while, it becomes intuitive, but it's not intuitive when you get started. I think I, 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 in, the, in the book, I give an example of, of, of doing this. But um, so one example is, so let's say you've got, uh, actually there's a concrete example I got from one of the, one of the organizations that was doing a, um, they, they, they print business cards, that's their business. And they wanted to do a different, a new type of business card with foil based printing or something like that. And, and how do you do that entire thing like in a small batch size? Well, the, the answer is you kind of start from back to front. So you start by updating the system that lets you kind of like print those cards and then, in, and then you kind of update the internal systems that, that kind of like manage the card printing and, and you add the new prices and, and you do all of this kind of stuff and it's, it's working and you're testing it, but it's not exposed to users. So no one's actually ordering these cards yet apart from the, the testers or whatever. And then mm -hmm. and maybe the very last thing you do is the one line code change that uh, expose that adds like to the drop down option, um, like foil based printer oh, right. and and maybe like once you do that and and they click next there's like a whole extra piece of ui that's been built and waiting there um kind of behind the curtain for weeks right but like it was there latent in the product and testable if you knew the kind of secret url maybe but until you add that little drop down um you 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 don't have to um you, you can kind of work on it kind of without worrying that users are going to come over it. And maybe that last piece you do is just a one line code change um, to add the drop down. But um, more likely what you do is you put that drop down behind a feature flag, right? So you don't just add the, you don't just turn it on, you create a feature flag that controls whether that extra item is in the drop down, and then you kind of roll it out to one market. Uh, that was something that some of the, um, 
yeah. some of the orgs I spoke to were doing, they would say like, we're going to, we're going to turn on this for, for Phoenix, the city of Phoenix, or we're going to turn this on for Denver um, and see how it works there before we roll it out to everyone, because we want kind of more safety. And that's one of the things that you need if you're going to be doing these like frequent changes is safety to kind of make a change and then pull it back again. Cool. Um, so we had sort of a, a, maybe more of a comment than a question from Jonas. Uh, Jonas uh, comes to us with a lot of experience. Thanks for joining us today, Jonas. Uh, he said, it sounds counterintuitive, but something I noticed at booking.com was that when they divided a huge monolith into multiple services, deployments decreased in a big way. Mm. Before the split, all the teams were deploying the monolith, which would result in a deployment every hour. After the split, it decreased by a lot as each team would deploy just their own part of the code. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I can believe that too. So think about it. It actually reduced the surface area of change. Right. And yeah, and again, like that locality becomes a lot more enforced, right? So you don't feel the need to like get your change out quickly because you don't want to batch it up with other stuff. You can kind of let it sit for like maybe a few hours or a few days while other changes from your team come into that same code base and then deploy that small batch without feeling like you have to roll it out. Uh, so here's one of those like 10,000 foot questions, right? So uh, what's some, James was asking this, what's some organizational slash funding models that will prevent your CD journey from even starting? What's a rough minimum maturity level you need? For example, project-based FX <laughs> funding tends to enforce waterfall. If you have yeah. to say what you're going to do, how long it will take, how it's going to be, blah, 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 before you can start, you're, you're kind of, you're, it's tough. It's a, I mean, it's a really good question. Um, and it's, a, it's like, so it's a fundamental question. It's a really insightful question. Um, a, a former colleague of mine, Jamak, did this talk about moving to microservices and she focused on funding. And I was like, why? Well, I don't get that. Right. Like, why is she talking about yeah. like OPEX and CAPEX? That doesn't make any sense. And then as we get through the talk, my mind was like blown open because it was like, whoa, Conway's law is like actually about like money flowing down through organizations. Um, I'm going to punt on it because I, I honestly, I, it's not something I, I, it's a really, really good question. And it wasn't something I focused on in the research because I wanted to talk more yeah. about kind of like the, the practices than the, the short answer. Of. Yeah. The short answer, Pete, that I've heard is you pretty much need a new CIO. Like the way people yeah, are new brains in that CIO maybe is, is, the, is the, you get a new sheriff in town. Uh, um, uh, I was talking to some people uh, uh, in the insurance industry, right? Which tends to be very monolithic, very slow moving, heavily yeah. regulatory pressure. And they want to, they want to move faster and they literally like, await the arrival of, of, of a top level executive that gets it, who can explain it to the other executives and then can force cultural change. Like yeah. if you're stuck in a situation where, where, you know, you, you do have to change those high level processes to change how a team, you know, yes, there are some teams that will sort of secretly in the dark, you know, shadow right. IT -ish do stuff, yeah. but to really get the benefits of this, you, yeah. you, it needs to be top down. Yeah. Yeah. You do have to change that funding model for sure. So we'll have to, I don't know if we can hook you up with somebody else who has. I would say like, I, I wish I had the link to hand, but my colleague Jamak, and I can never pronounce her last name, Del, Del Garbi, I think maybe, um, my former colleague for, at ThoughtWorks, uh, she did a really good talk about this um, around kind of like succeeding with, my, with like making something around the transition from microservices to, uh, from right. model to microservices. And, and I've seen the sort of stuff about you can't do, these DevOps if you don't have a new different way of budgeting. So I got one more question here. Um, how much does the book cover custom delivery platforms? That part seems much harder to solve per project organization and would benefit from tooling that, that I don't know of. Yeah, so, I mean, it was, it's, kind of, it's kind of tough because like I said, it was just very different. Each organization was doing, um, had solved this themselves. One organization was actually doing all of their delivery through a single tool. So they were using a tool called GoCD, which is actually an open source tool built by my former colleagues at ForWorks. Um, right. So they were actually able to use that single tool to drive uh, all of their CICD thing, because that's what that tool was fundamentally built to do. Um, besides that, I mean, so, so th th I do talk about this in, in the book. There's a chapter on, um, I think it's a chapter on this kind of, this idea of kind of delivery platforms and talk about, talk through some of the details of what they would, what folks were doing. Um, 
but yeah, it's a complex, it's a complex topic and it seems to be something that teams don't really talk about because it's so specific yeah. to their organization. I would throw in this other idea, which is, um, uh, hire an SRE early. So, so, uh, a lot of what we do at split, for instance, is we, we automate and script the heck out of things because we don't want, again, we don't want heroics. We want a repeatable, straightforward way to do various things that have to happen. So investing in, in that kind of automation where yeah. you're, you know, and, I, and we unfortunately are kind of up against the hour. So um, I will let people who are, who are st still on, we're definitely going to send out a recording. Um, I do want to announce that the person who won the goodies, the care package is Stephen L and Stephen, we will be in touch by email. Uh, Stephen gets some, uh, some salmon and other goodies from our, our in the wild package. Um, and, 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 um, I think in the follow-up email, we'll probably just provide yet another link to the book for those of you who haven't already got the book. If you registered for the webinar, I think we'll probably include a link to the book in case you didn't get it yet. Uh, and want to thank everybody for their time. I think, let's see. Um, I think that's it. We have actually covered all the questions, which is pretty awesome. Um, I want to thank everybody for their time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Pete, for doing the work to write the book and for joining Thanks us for today. That it's, uh, it's an ongoing project to understand, you know, the good news is lots of people are doing this. Yep. Right? And we just need to figure out how to share enough information for people to kind of keep triangulating towards what works. Yep. Yep. I think the key thing for me is like understanding the, the fundamental principles and then applying them differently in your context. And you, realizing that it's not one size fits all. You got to take those principles and then figure out how to apply them in your context. Yeah, you, we talked about Accelerate earlier. I'll do one more shameless pitch, which is for the DevOps handbook. Um, first 40 pages of this or 42 or something is, is pretty, pretty powerful. And actually that stuff's all included in the tail end of the fifth anniversary edition of Phoenix Project. So you actually, can get all that good stuff if you just get the latest copy of the Phoenix Project. These books are really worth reading to kind of help you get your brain tuned to the better ways of doing this stuff. Um, and on that note, I think we better wrap. Thanks everybody for their time and have a great day. Doodaloo.